thank you for joining us today. Today we're going to be taking a look at the Optex range. I've got Neil Foster from Optex today, and he's going to be running through and introducing some of the different solutions that are available from Optex. And this is going to be the first of a couple of webinars that we're going to be doing. The latter part will be in January next year. My name's Nathan Garner. I'm the project manager and one of the tech support team leaders here at Dynamic. And so today we're going to be handing over to Neil. He's going to be going through inducing the Optex side of things and they, these partnered with, with us here at Dynamic. So hopefully you will all enjoy this. And if you have any questions, if you put them in the Q&A section, myself or Neil will be able to come to those towards the end of the webinar. And I'll hand over to Neil now. We'll be able to share his screen there um, to go through the PowerPoint today. Magic. Thank you very much, Nathan. Uh, let me just share my screen. There we go. Hopefully everyone can see that. Um, we'll just give you a, a run through uh, this presentation. Um, just gives you a general overview of all the products that Optex can offer. Um, yeah, my name's Neil Foster. I'm one of the business development managers for Optex. Um, just a little bit about the company. We've got uh, over 40 years experience within the security industry, manufacturing everything to do with external uh, detection and also internal detection. Um, we've got worldwide coverage. Um, there's over 400 products that we do. We've got full sales and technical support in all regions, but especially within the UK. So we're very much here to help. If there's anything that anybody needs, then please feel free to, to come to us and we can, we can assist. So just giving you a whiz through this presentation, um, looking at a site, we just want you to think about the site. Every site's different. This could be a residential site, could be a nuclear power station, or could be anything in between the two. Um, there's lots of different considerations to look at on a site. So there's lots of different detection layers that we can actually provide you with an optex. So starting at the fence line, there may be a fence on the site, there may not be, but if there's a fence on the site, we can do a fence mounted protection system. That's going to let you know that anybody's trying to cut or climb that out of fence line. If we look at a next step further back, then we can do perimeter protection. So ideal for backing up that perimeter fence. You might not have a fence of a suitable standard to install that fence mounted technology on. We can give you the, uh, the active beams, for example, it'll give you an inner layer of detection. We can also then come back to the approach or the infill detection, so general passive inf infrared detection. We can then start and look at building protection, so that might be roof protection. A lot of warehouses out there at this moment in time that are starting to get targeted and people are identifying the fact that cameras may have some detection on it or might see a camera in a detector and are trying to bypass that. We've always got to stay one step ahead of anybody that's trying to attack a site. So there's lots of considerations to, to bear in mind. We've got passive infrared or laser detection that will look down the side of the buildings. So within Optex, we talk about multi-layered protection. Um, the good thing with Optex is we can supply you with all those different layers of detection. So no matter how anybody's trying to get into a site, what area of a site you're looking to cover, we have a different uh, product for that application. And one of the things to bear in mind is there's no one product that's going to cover everything on the site. Um, there's always variants that you have to take into consideration. So when we start and look at a site, um, we need to look at different things. So we need to look at the environment that the site's actually um, uh, surrounded by. So vegetation, vegetation can be a false alarm cause for some forms of detection, although we have other detection that will not false alarm with the vegetation in the background. Um, you've also got to look at animals, so small animals on there. Again, different type of detection will pick them up a different way, and it always comes down to what we class as the operational requirements. So what are you actually looking to pick up, what are you actually looking to detect? Um, where you tend to get animals causing false alarms, uh, for example, five, six rabbits that are in the same area, that to a detector will look very much as similar to a human being crawling along the floor. So it comes down to the operational requirement, what the criteria is for giving a, a, an activation and a detection. But we also do detection that would able, be able to filter that out as well. So it's just making sure you take into account all these background con considerations. You need to look at any light sources, any reflections. You also need to look at weather and temperature because they all have diff different effects to the different sensing technologies. You also then need to look at the site configuration. So is it an open site or a closed site? That's going to vary the way that you're actually going to design the site to make sure that you're, you're not getting any unwanted traffic that's coming through the site. You need to look at the ground levels. Um, so level ground will will be perfect for a detector unlevel ground is going to affect every detection type in a different way so we need to look at those and then also the the, the level of security that's required on the site 
And then when it comes down to actually building up the site, you need to look and see whether it's a temporary system or a permanent system, because that's going to affect how you're actually going to deploy the technology. The good thing from Optex, a lot of our detection technology that we do can actually be wire-free. We can also do IP technology and the traditional analog hardwired technology. And then you need to look at what you're actually triggering back to, whether it's going back to an MVR or DVR that's on site. Uh, some systems are going back to VMS platforms or whether it's just triggering through to an intruder panel. Um, we can help with all those configurations. So if we start and look at our site that we were building up this detection for, we mentioned initially the, uh, the technology on the fence line. So we have a fiber optic fence detection technology. This is ideal to detect anybody trying to cut or climb a fence. Um, it can also detect anybody trying to crawl underneath a fence. But you need to be quite specific in the way that that's actually installed. You need to make sure that you are going down ideally into a concrete plinth to stop anybody trying to pull away loose earth from below that fence line and, and, and get into that site. Um, the fiber optic technology is ideal for long perimeter runs. Um, with this technology, it's not affected by any radar, uh, electrical interference, radio interference not affected by any form of lightning strike because it's a, an inert glass that we install as a sensing element, then there's no issues with that around the site. And we can also do, as I said, long runs with this. So we can actually um, give you a centrally mounted alarm processing unit and run anything up to 20 kilometers within sensitive fiber before we start putting the, the sensing element on. So if anybody's looking at any large perimeters, looking at fence detection, then this is the ideal scenario because we can get rid of a lot of the infrastructure cost for the sites. Um, ideal for covering not only fences, but we can actually cover uh, walls and buildings. And you'll see down there the Hatton Garden robbery. We didn't have a system on there. Um, if we did have a system on there, it might have been a different outcome for that. Um, but we do lots of data centers. We do lots of banks and uh, vaults where we're actually installing the fiber optic cable on the fence, uh, sorry, on the wall of the building or actually embedding it in the wall of the building. And that will detect anybody trying to do a gross attack like that Hatton Garden robbery and will give us an activation for that. Another application for the fiber optic technology is actually detecting on fiber optic cables. So if you have fiber optic cables that are covering from one building to another building, a, a data connection between the two, we can actually make un, um, unused parts of that fiber a sensing element. So that will tell you if anybody's trying to tap into that fiber, break into that fiber or damage that fiber. So the benefits of fiber, um, we've kind of covered some of these, but it's an inert glass that you're installing. So one of the good things is it's intrinsically safe. Um, there's lots of sort of like ammunition storage applications that are out there, tend to be in a remote building, away from all the, uh, the services, the electric and communications, for example. So this product's ideal for that. Put an alarm processing unit in an office, run a uh, insensitive fiber out to where the explosive store and then put the sensing cable on the fabric of the building. It'll give you an activation. Um, it's uh, immune to the effects of lightning strikes, so we're not going to get any issue with any lightning strikes. As we've already said, EMI, radio, radio interference. Corrosion-free is another big benefit of the system. We give you around about a 20-year service life. So there's lots of fence-mounted solutions that are out there. There's lots of copper-based ones. If you get a nick on a copper cable, then you do have the chance of water ingress into there and degradation of the system. A lot of copper-based systems will actually quote that what you should be doing is replacing that cable every uh, four to five years. With the fiber optic solution, even if you get a nick on the outer sheath, there's a glass in there and a note glass that's in there. So that's never going to corrode. So we can give you 20 years service life when we're installing that fiber optic cable in the UV resistant conduit. And then the other good thing from the system is it actually requires minimal maintenance as well. So that the fiber optic solution can be used on any different fence type. So there's loads of fence types on there on the right hand side, but uh, traditional ones are um, weld mesh, chain link, palisade fence. We can do all of that. We can also do outriggers on the top of fences. We can do perimeter walls, as we've said on uh, data centers, uh, those kind of applications. We've had it used on rooftops in the past as well. So anywhere that you're gonna get a physical attack on there, we can give you an activation. Um, there are some considerations you need to take into account. So each different fence type should actually be a different zone because it's going to conduct in a totally different way. You need to look at the fence condition itself. The two fences that you can see on there, neither of those are suitable for a fence mounted system because you're just going to get uh, lots of unwanted false alarms. Those are very, very extreme cases, but you need to look at like chain link fences, the, uh, the tension on the fence. You need to look at palisade fences to make sure there's no loose palings. If there are, you're going to get a lot of uh, interference on that system and false alarms. You also need to look at any vegetation that might be grown through the fence line. Again, both of these scenarios are going to get false alarms with the vegetation on the fence line. 
you can filter that out, but by filtering that out, that increases the chance of somebody actually being able to bypass the system without causing a, a, an activation on there. So ideally, if we saw a fence line like that, we'd be quoting and saying that you actually need to cut back and maintain that vegetation. And it's all about getting the best performance out of the system. We also look at climbing risks. So with climbing risks, um, a lot of people don't actually pick up on this, but if you've got a fence mounted system that runs around this site and you've got that uh, sliding gate that's on there, the gate's probably not the sliding risk, but it's actually the big fence posts that are in there as well. Uh, somebody can come along quite easily with an airframe ladder and try and climb over that. So we actually have different technologies in like the red scan product that would sit on an extension piece on that fence and would then just give you that uh, infill detection to cover all that area. And these are the things that we try and point out when we get involved in the site surveys. Fence mounted system would be ideal for that site, but the weak point on that site is going to be the gate. Now, depending on the security of that site, that might be a condition uh, consideration. It might not be. They might say that, that they don't see it as a high enough threat level that someone will come along and target the gate post. But the other thing on the gate is on that one, it's a nice clean area below that gate. You do often get it where it's uh, undulating ground levels or sloping ground levels, and that can often be a, a risk of somebody climbing under the or crawling underneath there. So again, with something like the red scan technology, it will just give you that infill detection, that backup in case anybody tries to, to defeat that. We then look at vibration. So on this site, if that was a fence mounted system on the right hand side where that um, fence line is, that railway track is gonna cause a massive amount of vibration. The benefit with our system is we've got alarm processing units where we can actually look at the background vibration that's there. So every time that train goes down that track, there'll be a vibration that'll be um, conducted onto that fence line. We can actually look at that vibration and filter that out so that wouldn't cause a false alarm. Now there's lots of systems that are out there that don't have the parameter settings that we do that can actually filter that out for you. So again, it's just a case of looking at the site, taking into consideration all the environmental conditions that are around there and the fabric of the fence, etc. Um, and then you can put together the fence mounted system. But we're always here to help. Um, as I say, we've got people all over the UK, technical and sales support. So I'm more than happy to get involved in the site surveys and assist with these site designs for you. Moving into the next step, this is the active beams. So on the active beams, transmitter at one end, receiver at the other end, uh, anybody breaking the beam is going to give you an activation. So ideal for giving you a virtual perimeter line. So that could be on top of a fence like that one there, or it could actually be there isn't a fence there. A lot of car dealerships tend to have active beams around them because um, it's just giving you a nice clean cut uh, detection area. Um, with the active beams, we can go up to a 200 meter wired detection zone. Um, one thing to bear in mind with that is that is just one output over the full 200 meters. So it needs to look at your site uh, requirements what you're actually looking to do if you're looking to trigger a preset on a camera you're not going to look at a 200 meter zone because if that's going through to a monitoring center your operator has got no chance of identifying what's happening on that site so generally when we're looking at uh, active beam solutions and if it is going through to off-site monitoring it would be a 50 meter zone is what we're actually looking at but you can go longer than that so we can go up to 200 meters on a hardwired solution that could be the analog or could actually be ip we can go up to 100 meters on a wire free solution um, ideal for open perimeters, uh, the first alert, so anybody trying to breach the perimeter, that's why they kind of get used in a lot of car dealership uh, sort of applications. Um, also with these technology as well, uh, not prone to false alarms. Uh, sorry, I should have been pressing the slides there to keep whizzing through the slides. Um, not prone to false alarms, active beams, you've got transmitter at one end, receiver at the other end, uh, you need something to break that beam. There's different variants that are out there, the top uh, part of the slide that you can see there is the narrow beam, a twin beam. That'll give you two transmitters talking to two receivers. Something breaks that, it gives you an activation. You can get plastic bags, birds, that kind of thing flying around that could give you an activation. But we actually have a quad series range as well, which is actually looking for a larger target. So that same item that would cause a false alarm in a twin beam, when it blows through a quad beam or flies through a quad beam zone, wouldn't give you an issue for it. But again, it comes down to looking at the site requirements. Is it a clean site? Is it a dirty site? And again, we can assist with that. Some of the considerations, so weather conditions, um, you need to bear in mind that with an active beam, it's a transmitter at one end, it's transmitting IR light to a receiver at the other end. If you get fog built up on a site, that can potentially cause issues for you. Not so much on the 50 meter zone, more on the 200 meter zones. But again, we actually have technology where it'll look at the background uh, signal strength that's getting through to the receiver and can actually talk back to the transmitter to tell it to, to uh, increase its power. Um, you need to look at things like the temperature as well. So we can do wire-free beams. The thing to bear in mind with the wire-free beams is 
if you do have your frosty conditions down the bottom right hand corner there potentially you can get frost build up on a, a wire free beam because you don't have any uh, heaters in there so again you just need to make sure that you're looking at the right product for the right environment looking at ground levels so anywhere that you've got undulating ground again a lot of these slides are actually showing the extremes but the one down the bottom right hand corner wouldn't be an ideal solution for an active beam because there's just too many crawl through zones you might think that's an extreme case but we have actually seen uh, people install active beams in those kind of areas if you're installing active beams it is point a with a transmitter mountain height is to point b and it's a straight line between the two so if you've got an undulating ground like that bottom you are going to get crawl through zones you also need to consider and look at the site requirement of what they're actually looking to pick up and if they are looking up to pick a crawling target through there we can do that with the active beams but again you just need to identify from the installer's point of view exactly what you're looking for and then we're also looking at the power and connectivity so again we can do the wire free technology we can do hardwired uh, analog or we can do hardwired uh, ip as well so moving back to one of the technologies that a lot of people are familiar with the optics a lot of people that we talk to optics about go yeah we know the sip red wall detectors um this is a, a our bread and butter technology uh, you'll see it on thousands of sites around the uk used for very good general trap protection around a site Ideal for volumetric, but we can do things like the 100 meter by three meter, which will sit on a perimeter of a site, for example. It's got to give you really contact outputs or IP integration, so you can get multiple outputs on the technology like the SIP 100. It'll actually give you three outputs. So a creep zone, uh, a zone that'll go up to 50 meters that we call the near zone, and then the far zone that goes 50 to 100 meters. So with these different outputs, it actually help you track somebody moving around a site because you'd be able to fire the, uh, the presets and get the alarm inputs to it. Uh, also very cost effective technology because it's single point technology. You've just got a cable to the, uh, the passive infrared itself. You don't have to get to either end. Um, or again, a lot of people say they know the red wall technologies, but are not actually familiar with the wire free solution. So we do a wire free solution with the red walls where you can actually deploy red wall detector with a built in aerial and transmitter onto it. And then you just install in the receiver to get that signal back into the MVR, DVR, whatever you're triggering back to. Now that's ideal for a site where you go back and site requirements have changed. Um, often we'll go to sites, a system installed two, three, four years ago will have been ideal for that site at that time. But these sites are always changing. Might be that you now need a, an additional detector across the, the other side of a compound or a car park. Again, cost effectiveness, you're not going to want to rip up that tarmac. So again, look at the wire-free solution, uh, wire-free red wall. You can drop it on there. It'll give you the detection that's required, and it's going to fire your inputs back into your, your NVR. Um, again, considerations on these, you do need to look at uh, weather conditions, temperature. Um, you need to look at environment, uh, background environment or where you might have things blowing around. Um, passive infrared detector looks at the background target temperature also looks, looks at the background temperature and then looks at a target temperature and it's looking for the contrast between the two and it's looking for that moving around so there are certain conditions where you can get uh, false activations you need to look at your ground levels because again these ground levels are going to affect the way that a red wall's uh, working when you actually install the red wall you install it at an optimum mountain height which is usually four meters and what that detector is designed to do is if it's looking for a 1.6 meter target it's designed to ground the optics just beyond that point now installing it on sloping ground if you're looking up a hill that's going to reduce the range if you're looking down a hill that's going to actually extend the range of the detector so you need to take that into consideration when it comes to the, the area that you're looking to cover, the detection range that you're expecting, and also the installation height. Um, looking at your power and connectivity, again, we've kind of covered some of this off, but you've got the wire-free technology. You've also got the wired um, analog and the wired IP as well. So we can just give you IP detectors that are going to sit on a network and then fire activations back into an MVR for you. And again, we need to look at things like pesky rabbits. Um, one or two rabbits are not going to cause a false alarm on a, a red wall detector. If you get five, six, ten rabbits running about in the same area, it's not dissimilar to a human target trying to crawl across that, that, that ground. So you need to bear in mind the operational requirement, what you're actually looking for. If you're looking for um, a, a potential target crawling along a ground, then you might get a false or a nuisance alarm from rabbits. So again, it's just looking at the site requirements. We also have a, a large range of other 
passive infrared detectors that sit within the Optex family. Um, so we have products like the HX and the QX. They actually have small animal tolerance in them, so they'll be a lot more tolerant to the rabbits running around within the, the field of view. You've got a high mountain height with these, typically 2.3 to 3 metres, and you can actually adjust the detection range. So these will be used in a lot of environments for residential applications, commercial applications, but often even on the larger uh, project kind of applications, you've got areas where you're looking for infill detection. And these products shouldn't be forgotten about for this because they are just rock solid to do the job, give you the detection that you need. Uh, and there's always areas that you can, you can deploy these technologies. So we can look at different uh, options. So the two products that are on there, uh, on the left-hand side, you've got the BXS. The BXS will uh, ideal for looking at a, a building um, you've got the detector which sit in the center there look out 12 meters to the left 12 meters to the right these detectors use dual layer passive infrared so you've got a, a fixed upper layer and adjustable lower layer now on these detectors i've actually got these installed at home i've got three dogs that run around the back garden they get zero false alarms i can set the system on a night time um, and no false alarms even when you let the dogs out um, the wife actually gives me a hard time because she has to go out and trigger the lights because it triggers the lights as well with these sensors where the animals running around doesn't. So I think I'll have to install a little push button for it to actually be able to activate the lights. Um, so we do that in the BXS. We also do the little FTN. Little FTN is ideal for sitting just looking across a window. We actually get lots of clients that will install these on like warehousing applications as well. So where you've got open plan business parks, you don't need a big wide open detection, uh, 30 meter by 20 meter detector looking out into all the areas where the dog walkers might be passing by, the kids playing football, somebody driving through the estate. You need to keep that detection back to the building. Keeping that detection back to the building makes it very, very stable. You only get an activation when somebody comes to the side of the building. So these are used in a lot of residential applications, but also used in a lot of the uh, commercial applications as well. And it might be small commercial like the, the retail application or even open it up to the bigger project kind of stuff as well. We also have other technology or other detectors that use exactly the same technology. So the one that's on the left or the one that's on the right hand side there will go there first is a 12 meter 90 degree detector. Again, using dual layer passive infrared. I've got these installed at home. The dogs can run around, zero false alarms. Um, these are ideal again for where you want volumetric coverage in these areas. We can do these as hardwired. We can do these as wire-free. We've also got the newer product there that's on the left-hand side. That's a WX. Now, that WX is basically like putting two VXs in the same housing. That's going to give you a 180-degree coverage at 12 meters, and it's going to split it into a left-hand side and a right-hand side to give you those presets to fire into the cameras or, or fire through to whatever technology you want. Um, ideal for these commercial residential applications. Um, the technology, we use SMDA logic. That's just looking at the background lighting levels, looking at the background interference, and it'll just filter out anything that may cause false alarms. Um, you've got nice adjustment on these detectors with the fixed upper layer, which is this detection here on the, the BXS, and then you've got the lower layer, which you can adjust. So you can actually do range selection on these. So if you don't want 12 meters, you just dead easy slide the PIR down on the bottom uh, either side that you want to reduce the range on, and it'll just drop that range for you. So I've got these installed, as I say, uh, open plan. There's no fences around my, my front garden. It looks out into a next door neighbor's. Um, his car is actually parked right next to my fence. Every time he goes and gets into it, no false alarms. It'll only ever trigger when somebody's in my side of the fence. So they are just rock solid. Can't stress how much. And people will be sitting listening to this saying, yeah, he's bound to say that. But it is literally get one of these detectors install it in your own property and the usual feedback that we get is i didn't think it was working so i had to go out and trigger it myself to make sure they are just rock solid and do the job with the technology we've got small animal and pet tolerance so on the bottom slides that you can see there human being on the right hand side walking through is triggering upper and lower so we'll give you an activation with the range selection anything that's triggering the upper layer but it doesn't trigger the the lower layer for example the car that might be out the range that you set again it'll just ignore that the, uh, the animal that's walking around, it's either going to be triggering the upper layer further away or it's going to be triggering the lower layer closer to the detector. So it's not going to cause a false activation for you. So you can just deploy these again and they are rock solid. 
We do these as well in wire-free solutions. Um, a lot of the residentials will look for wire-free. Uh, a lot of residentials don't want cables dotting about. You install these detectors typically at 1.2 meter. Um, install it away from the building, have it look in the area that you want and just go wire-free back into a, a receiver in the attic, for example. Or again, it'll actually work in that within the commercial environment as well. But we can actually go wired and we can actually go IP with them as well. With these products, we do various different uh, versions of aesthetics with them. So the covers that are on the top, we can do black, we can do silver or grey, whichever colour you want to call it, or we can do the white. Um, we can also do custom colours on them as well. So if you've got a customer that wants to try and hide the detector as much as possible, we can get them wrapped, we can get them sprayed, so it will actually uh, blend them in with the background. Um, obviously, the only thing that you can't paint is actually the white lens on it because that needs to be a C, but all of the other... Um, reinforced polycarbon on it can be can be colored to a, a color of your choice um and then with the we're giving you volumetric coverage with the separate outputs ideal for firing into uh to ptz's with this technology we're also now moving into the realms of video verification as well so we actually have uh, app-based verification with these in a couple of different formats um the vxic mod is a nice little unit so the vxi is actually this detector here the c mod is actually the camera module that sits on the top of it uh, that will just get 12 volts to it to power it. It'll just then hook up to your uh, Wi-Fi network. Uh, anybody triggers the detector, it can then push a, a push notification through to a mobile phone with the video verification of what's caused that activation. Um, the camera's two day and night, so it'll work in, in dark. It's got IR illumination on it as well. It's got a microphone on it, so you can get one-way audio of, for it. Um, so just a fantastic little solution for anybody that might be going out and just doing um, intruder alarm systems, wanting to add on a simple little uh, visually verified system, then that system works really, really well. Um, if anybody's wanting any details on this, feel free to go back to Nathan and the team or come back to myself and we can send more info out. Um, then looking at some of the other technologies. So if you're looking at building detection or fence line detection, we have the LiDAR product. So the LiDAR product uh, is a, called a red scan and it's just going to create a vertical wall of detection or a, or a horizontal plane of detection, which is going to give you that infill detection. Um, works on what we call time of flight technology, uh, where what we're doing is pulsing a laser out. That laser will hit the target or the background and get a reflection back in. And we measure the time for it to go out, hit that target or hit that background and come back in. And that relates to how far that target is away from the head of the unit. But what we also do is send a sample every quarter of a degree. So as you get an activation, we know exactly how far away that target is. We know where through that cycle that it is. So that's what gives us the X, Y coordinates. So within the detection area that you see, we can set up any preset area that's required. Um, we can then mask areas out that we don't need detection on or we can concentrate on what we call hot spots and just set up particular areas for presets and you can configure that in any way that you want fantastic thing about the red scans again it's just rock solid it doesn't need any lighting levels it doesn't matter whether it's black dark or whether it's daylight it'll work um, the detection area isn't affected by temperature so it doesn't adjust you can set this up to say i want 24.3 meters worth of detection and it doesn't matter the external environment, it will always just give you that detection and stop at that point. And again, it's something that it's, it's hard to believe unless you've actually seen the technology being deployed. Um, we can give you a, a vertical wall of detection, so that can cover a perimeter fence line. Um, we can give detection that even on the, the bottom right-hand slide there is um, museums and galleries that we do a lot of work with, where what we'll actually do is set four paintings up as you can see there is what we call hot spots so those different four paintings will be four preset areas and on an internal application where it's a nice clean application we can actually look at anything down to like a five centimeter target given an activation so that's somebody trying to put their hand in towards that painting will give an activation for but somebody leans on the wall not where the painting is will totally ignore that there's there's really not that many technologies that can be that accurate in the way that they work but the red scan will do that. So we've got these deployed in loads of applications, museums and galleries right the way through to uh, airports, nuclear power stations, just loads of different applications. So we can also give you a, a, a virtual horizontal detection, ideal for skylights or, or thrown objects. For, again, that's one of the other applications that the red scans are used in. So we do these in two different variants. We do the 3060, which uh, will give you a 30 meter detection range at 190 degrees which depending on which model you get, we can actually uh, extend that out to a 50 meter detection area at 190 degrees. We can give you vertical or horizontal mounting on them for different detection patterns. 
Um, you've got automatic area setting, so you can just tell it to learn the environment that it can see, and it'll set up the, uh, the outside detection edge on it. Anti-masking function on it again. So with the 2020 version, the smaller version that I'll show you in a second, that's actually a grade three product. If you're looking to put it on an intruder alarm system, we'll actually have uh, multiple units that are installed within those environments. Might be on a skylight, anybody dropping down through that skylight, then the red scanner can actually give you the first uh, activation for that confirmed activation. Um, external environments, you've got things like fog cancellation algorithms. So again, it's looking at the background fog level that's there and it knows to crank its performance up as the fog comes in. Um, unique detection algorithms, so it's just looking for human activity. And then there's different scene selections, whether it's outdoor or indoor or what those applications are. So just try starting to deploy these and show you a few different areas that they can work. So on here, red scan mounted on a fence line or an extension piece on a column, for example. And then we can just have it angled down and just giving you that vertical wall of detection. So that will work for infill detection within a site. So give you that perimeter boundary. That will work for approach detection. Some people want to know that people are actually approaching the fence line or may even be on a larger project sat within a sterile zone. Um, looking at a commercial environment. So on this site, um, there's actually a car park on the right hand side of that fence line. On the left hand side, that's the site. Um, could have gone for a traditional fence mounted detection system on there. The problem that you'd have is if anybody could use any access equipment, i.e. on this one, reverse a van up to the, the side of that fence line, climb on top of the van, jump over the top of the fence line on a fence mounted system, you wouldn't actually get an activation. The other typical scenario would either be looking at an active beam, for example, but again, that fence is a climbing aid, so you'd need to keep a metre and a half to two metres back. Or you could have looked at passive infrared thermal, um, any kind of analytics, for example. The issues that you have there is where those wagons are parked there, you can guarantee when you go back tomorrow, somebody's reversed a wagon virtually up to the fence line. With the red scan, you can actually put an extension piece in, so lift it up two metres above the height of the fence, and then just literally drop that detection down directly inside that fence line. So that's a nice tight detection area. It doesn't matter what they're doing on the inside of the site, they're never going to affect that. But yet when anybody tries to cut, climb, open the palings, get through that fence in any way, shape or form, we're going to give you an activation. And again, we can cut that fence line down into four 15 metre segments if required. So you can get very, very accurate presets of what's just caused that activation. Solar farms, loads of solar farms out there. We've got red scans mounted horizontally giving uh, infill detection. Um, just gives you a lovely plane of detection that'll, that'll cover across there. Again, you can set up exactly the boundary that you want, so it's not going to overshoot that boundary. Builder detection, um, there's loads of data centers that are out there with red scans on. Uh, we do a swing bracket so you can pick exactly the detection area that you want to set up that detection. So on that one, it's just set um, literally so people can work down the bottom as those two workmen are, but anybody comes higher up um, where that fence is and the ledge is, anybody tries to pass that area will give you an activation for. And again, coming to the building detection, this is something that is coming more and more. We're getting more and more applications where, you know, we've always got to, in our industry, try and stay one step ahead of the criminals. The criminals are always looking at the technology that's deployed there and always looking at ways that can combat it. So if they see a detector on the side of a building at four metres, see a camera on the side of a building at four metres, what we're finding now is they'll actually go into the neighbour's site, get a long uh, scaffold as extension ladder and actually go up directly onto the roof of the site. We've actually known sites where people have done that. They've gone along, found a skylight, dropped down the skylight onto the racking, gone within the site, taken what they wanted, gone back out the, next, the same way, and their client hasn't known anything about it until the next morning. So there's more and more applications out there where we're actually looking for the rooftop detection. So as I said earlier on, we do the 3060, which is the longer range, or we do the 2020. 2020 originally did 20 meter by 20 meter at 95 degrees but again we've actually brought out a model that will do an extension on that so it'll do a 30 meter radius at 95 degrees ideal for walls um, ideal for uh, horizontal uh, detection areas covering skylights for example and um, both these units can be uh, PoE compatible so you can just drop it onto a network have it firing back over the network to the MVR the VMS or whatever sat on there so with the 2020, it's just going to give you that detection. So that vertical uh, wall of detection or that horizontal plane of detection, that's like an invisible ceiling. If anybody trying to drop down there, you'll get an activation. So again, just looking at some applications, residential, um, everyone's got the, you know, the roof terrace out there that they want to protect, for example. Um, install a red scan top left-hand corner of that building and you just set up exactly the detection area they want and the area that you want it to cover. 
Uh, internal applications, there's loads of data centers out there. We've actually got red scans uh, installed, uh, giving an invisible ceiling detection. So anybody trying to drop down uh, from the skylight, we've actually got them installed under floors as well. So uh, co-location data centers have got big void areas where all the cables run underneath. Um, we're seeing uh, issues where people are lifting a floor tile, trying to drop under one area and pop up in another area. So installing them above and below the data centers is a common application, along with covering the actual the, the face of the cabinet as well. Um, bonded warehouses, distribution centers, there's loads of red scans installed, literally just giving invisible walls a detection. So it might be that it's a shared space and you know, somebody doesn't want somebody from another area swapping across into this area. So again, we can just give the vertical wall a detection. Or again, where you've got secure stores in anything that might be electrical stores, they've got secure stores in them. Um, you just put the, the red scans around to box those areas off. Loads of applications in that and even uh, logistics distribution sites as well. Um, we then come on to one of the other technologies that we can give you access to, which is the radar technology. Um, radar technology um, is fantastic for covering large open sites um, it's going to give you detection beyond the fence line so with this technology what we can actually do is the different zones that you see here so this ellipse would just be the detection area so inside the perimeter of this site we can set up a, a tracking and alerting zone so anybody's moving around in, in here hits a criteria we can give them an alert um, but what you can actually do and a lot of sites are actually looking at this now is uh, radar detection will actually see beyond the fence so what you can actually do with it is set up a tracking zone, but not have it alerting. So if somebody's coming to um, have a look at a site, try and work out how they're going to break into it, they may have done something prior to breaking into it. Anybody moving around the outside of that site, the radar can pick them up. You can set the criteria of when it actually starts to track them. And all that you do is record the evidence. So the radar will actually take over the control of the camera. It'll spin it around to the area that's required. It'll zoom it in and it'll basically track a target that's moving around. Um, so as somebody's moving around there, you get all that evidence of what they've done prior to the point that they actually break in. So that can be really fantastic for uh, looking at the evidence. Um, so as we said, it's actually going to cue the camera. It's going to track somebody that's moving around. What we also give you is this GUI interface. And on here, there's a little black cross hair there, which shows you exactly where this target is. And then this little snail trail, this little black wiggly line is actually where that target has moved around. So what we can actually do for you is we can actually give you this information. So if you've got a security guard that's monitoring this, they can see exactly what's happening. We can also give them the view of the camera. Um, but for example, the Hick vision cameras, we can take control of those. We can follow a target that's moving around. That would all be recorded onto the MVR. And then you've got the GUI interface that you could look at as well. Um, the other good thing with the radar technology is it actually works in a lot of environments where a lot of other technologies wouldn't work. So some people look at thermal cameras, uh, look at thermal detection or look at analytics, for example. Um, if that camera can't see, it's not going to detect. So the scene that you can see there is basically the, the radar that's working. It's picked up uh, this target that's within its field of view here. We get the crosshairs for it, we get the alert for it, and we get the tracking of it. But when you actually look at the thermal camera, it can't see anything because it's over a long range. The radar technology will continue to work. So the good thing about this, yeah, you can't see where somebody is, but the camera's going to continue to follow them until they get closer, until the fact that you can actually pick out what that target is and what they're doing. So again, it's just looking at the right technology for the right application. With the radar technology, it's also very, very cost effective. Uh, we can go long detection ranges, so we can go anything from 125 meter by 40 meter, and we can push that right up to 600 meters, for example. Um, I would love to say there's loads of applications in the UK where we'd be looking for lots of 1.4 kilometer radar panels, it tends not to be in the UK, uh, but we do have technology that can go that far. And the thing that you need to bear in mind with the radar technology, um, I've actually done sites in the past where people have looked at uh, active beams around the perimeter of a site, a large disused airfield. Um, we looked at the equipment cost, looked at the overall project cost, because the issue with that one is there was no um, services out there, so they had to get power out there, they had to get infrastructure out there to get the signals back. Um, that active beam project, all of a sudden, uh, the equipment cost was just an insignificant part of it. There was a humongous uh, you know, infrastructure cost to be deployed on that. Um, that project actually within the, the, the site itself had buildings, had some columns with some cameras that were already deployed. And what we could do, because we can cover the 600 meters with the radar technology, we actually deployed a radar system that covered the entire airfield 
at the same cost of what it would have been to cover a small part of that site with the active beams. So when you're actually looking at the radar technology, you might initially look at the piece of equipment cost and think, yeah, it's got a decent cost to it, a reassuringly expensive cost to it. But when you actually build it into the overall project, it can actually look, come out a lot more cost effective than a lot of other solutions. Um, and then looking at the high performance of the system with the radar technology, we can use what we call filters. So when we're using filters, we can start and look at the amount of displacement of where the radar originally picked up a track from how far that's moved. We can look at total distance. We can look at direction. We can look at speed. We can look at the size of the reflection. When you start taking all those filters into account, we can give you a rock solid system that's only going to give you an activation for that human target who's hitting that criteria for you. So it is very, very stable. The good thing about the radar technology, the two scenes that are on here, the top one is when a radar was installed, no filters on it at all, and it's got 149 targets on it. So you use all this information, which gives you all the, the, the distance, the displacement, the direction, the speed information, the size of the target, for example. You build these filters in, and then you just get the one activation, which is the target that you want. So once you've actually got the radar deployed, you've got it um, set up into box that you want. It's going to have the camera spinning around, zooming in at the target, and it's going to work out very cost-effective for you. So... Um, that's kind of like the overview of the physical detection, and now just a few reasons why we'd actually that are out there, um, and not trying to, uh, uh, you know. Oh, I've got an unstable network apparently. Are you still getting this all right, Nathan? Yeah, it's come back now. I've been broke up a bit there, but it's back on now. All right, okay, cool. So apologies about that, everybody. Yeah, so the, the systems out there that will work on video motion detection, as I said earlier uh, in the presentation, everything's got strengths and everything's got weaknesses. Um, we get a lot of feedback from a lot of monitoring centers, a lot of installers that are using different technology. Um, if you're looking at anything that's uh, you know analytics-based, it's working off the pixels that are on the camera. Um, you do get things like insects on the camera lens that can cause issues. You do get things like shadows, like this is one of my sites that I've played around with, set up filters so the cat wouldn't give an activation. You get a nice low sunlight that comes across, you get a big shadow behind the cat, and unfortunately on some systems it will ping activations off. Other thing is outside light sources, so again if you get a, a light that's actually um, not allowing the IR light to, to perform properly and it's switched into colour rather than mono, again you get that shadow, that's going to cause issues for you. Weather conditions, um, a lot of people um, try to use the analytics on cameras with uh, inbuilt IR. Um, they predominantly get a lot of reflection from rain. Those sort of things are going to start causing uh, issues with the analytics picking up. Um, and then light level changes. If your camera actually can't see, again, light level changes coming across the site can cause false alarms. The worrying thing is there's more and more filters that can be put on, but it just increases the chance of... Um, missed activations as well so again if you're just using uh, analytics on a camera it has to be correctly lit so you're actually going to illuminate that site correctly you have to make sure that your camera can actually see because if it can't see it's not going to detect um, so with the physical detection you, there's a lot of benefits to using physical detection in that you've got that stable detection that's going to give you an activation when required the other thing is you don't have an issue with single point failure you know if one of the two items camera combined with a detector if one fails the other's still going to work so you might get an activation and not a camera field of view you might get um, the camera working but the detector might fail but at least you've still got some kind of coverage rather than putting all your eggs in the uh, the one basket as i say so that hopefully roughly on time nathan i think we're about there on time yeah, um kind kind of concludes the uh, the presentation um appreciate there's a lot to take in there it kind of is a little bit machine gun fire but hopefully it gives everybody a bit of a broad understanding and uh, as we've said with nathan we can go into these in a lot more information in the new year um, and look at more specifics on on particular products and uh, and different applications um but any questions coming nathan do you know um no i don't know i think you've um explained it all pretty well uh, uh, as you're going through it neil um that was pretty spot on for for us um i'm glad you took the time to uh, run through this with our customers today um, obviously, as Neil said, we're looking at doing a few more webinars um, at the beginning of next year um, to look more in depth at some of the different um, product ranges from Optex, um, which will help benefit our customers because um, there's a lot of different scenarios out there. 
Um, sometimes customers may prefer to use um, camera detections, um, but physical detectors can be the, the way to go, especially for larger sites um, that use in a perimeter and fence line, stuff like that. There's um, a multitude of different solutions uh, that are available. Um, so it's always best to kind of check to see which uh, system would work best in which scenario, um, which you can talk to ourselves here at Dynamic CCTV uh, with myself and the rest of the project team. Um, we've also got uh, Neil and the guys um, over at Optex um, that would also be able to help you there and go through any um, site designs or anything. Um, but thank you for joining us today. Um, we'll be sending out a PDF version of the slides for anyone that needs them. Um, I look forward to seeing you on the next webinars uh, with me and Neil um, in hopefully a better 2021 next year. <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely, yeah. But thank you very much, and thank you, Neil, for, for doing that for us. I really appreciate it. No problem at all. Anybody got any questions, feel free to come back to the guys at Dynamic or come back directly to myself, um, and we're, we're here to assist. Thank you. See you later. Cheers. Thank you. Bye.